All right, everybody. Welcome to our talk. Hi, my name is Dirk. I'm a principal solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. I recently joined the ISV team, so I now work with software companies on their multi-dimensional transformation. And let me do a quick detour at the very beginning. Yesterday, we did AWS housewarming, a day full of hands-on workshops across the city. If you joined, please make sure you provide your feedback to the workshop owners. If you didn't join, reach out to your AWS account team for more information. Yeah, my name is uh, Gregor. I've been spending many, many years uh, with integration and messaging systems. I am now part of the AWS serverless team. And since we're right after lunch, our goal for today is that now your stomach is full. Our goal is to also fill your hits with content. And for that, we've chosen the very nice topic of advanced integration patterns and trade-offs for loosely coupled systems. And the story about integration usually starts with two boxes and a line. Wow. Okay, actually, we work on the integration topic for quite a while, actually a couple of decades. So enough time to lose some hair or to have it turn gray. So this topic is not new, <laughs> but still lots of folks ask us lots of questions about it. So how does that work and what are the trade-offs? So it's actually easy to draw a line between two boxes, but then integration has many faces. We can see some of them here on this slide. We have file transfer, which is around virtually everywhere. And then we have APIs and all their cranky uncles. So what are the cranky uncles in the first place? I refer to stuff like SOAP, for instance. Then we have messaging and streaming. Uh, Gregor wrote a whole book about messaging. But uh, since a while, we also have streaming. And the question is already, what do we use? Do we use messaging? Do we use streaming? Well, and in the end, you also need to either uh, choreography or um, orchestrate everything. So that's actually a lot of questions that come up. Yeah, the reason I'm standing so far away is because Dirk said he doesn't use SOAP. But that is it for bad German humor. Let's go back to <laughs> integration. <laughs> Our <laughs> key insight here is it used to be that we think mostly about the boxes, right? The stuff we build that we deploy, the applications, and then somehow at the end, we kind of have to wire this together, right? Uh, can't quite avoid it. And that is not the way the world is anymore, especially not in the cloud, especially not in a serverless environment, is integration is not an afterthought. It's an integral part of your architecture and your software delivery lifecycle. And because it was so much fun, we go back to our two blue boxes and the line. So Dirk mentioned, right, this is easy to draw and he showed sort of what kind of broad spectrum this can take on. But even instead of going broad, if we go a little bit deeper, we can also see that there's quite a few questions. Is this synchronous or asynchronous? What's the inter action model here? Is this a point-to-point? -point? Is this a pops up um, What does this actually show? Does this show data flow or control flow? We'll find out soon that this is something very different. Um, what about data formats, right? Uh, is B actually the system B or the instance B? Because the system B could have many instances. What about errors? Does this always go from left to right or does this have to happen twice maybe because it didn't work the first time? So it's a very interesting topic and that's why we weren't joking when we said, you yeah, know, we're going to make sure your heads are full after lunch as well. Right. And also, I know it's, it's quite human. We want it all. We want just a solution or an approach that solves all our problems. But the ugly truth is there is actually no silver bullet in software architecture or in any other question of life. And that's why we always need to be aware of the so-called face healer that might be an approach, a technology or something that we are told will solve all our problems. But in fact, every architecture decision comes with some pain. So there's always something that sucks. You cannot get around this. So and you need to be aware of that. And if you are a software architect, you just need to um, assess the options that are on the table and are pretty much aware of all the trade offs of those options. So you now you might say, OK, great. I get the idea. This stuff is important. This stuff is interesting. So let's get started. 
I hinted that integration is no longer an afterthought and that makes us think about when we draw this line, is this integration or is this a distributed system? And that is a very good question. And the reason the question is such a good one is because the answer to this is not really a technical answer. Technically it's all the stuff we just talked about. The difference is in the life cycles, the level of control you have and the teams that are doing it. So it starts with one-off, like you have two boxes on a line, you might be migrating data from the left to the right and you do this once with a dedicated team. You might be synchronizing data where you do this sort of once a day or every so often, right? And you build this once and largely let this run for a long time time. Then people always um, make me partly responsible for the enterprise service buses. Um, again, technically nothing wrong with the ESB. What happened there a little bit was that the ESP, ESB was slower than the component development and it was done by a dedicated team and then you had this whole issue between the people who make the boxes and the people who make the lines and they didn't quite sync up. And then the way to fix that is really to think about it as an embedded application. So the boxes and the line come out of the same team at the same cadence and they have complete level of control over both the boxes and the lines. So this is a nice spectrum. There is no right or wrong here and you also see that there's products that correspond to these different ways of working. But we need to keep this in mind. Technically it looks very similarly but having different levels of control, having different teams and having different life cycles makes a big difference. And that's when we talk about integration. For today, we also mean distributed systems, but there's a fine nuance as we just explained. So building these systems, there's a couple of important things to keep in mind and that's what we call these advanced integration patterns and trade-offs in our beautiful title and we picked four of those we picked coupling we picked control flow message ordering and error handling so let's start with my favorite topic coupling right as soon as you have the two boxes and the line somebody will say oh you need to make that loosely coupled but architecture is not so easy. Dirk hinted, right? This is about trade-offs. There's always something that's gonna suck or that has an issue. So you cannot just follow the simple advice like, oh, always decouple everything. So first, we need to understand better and more nuanced what coupling is really about. Coupling is a measure of independent variability. If B changes, does A have to change. Now change comes in many flavors. This could be a functional change, a data format change, a location change, a performance change, an availability change, right? So these are all aspects of coupling. And coming back to Dirk's law, decoupling has a cost. So it's not the case that you should always decouple everything because decoupling things is not free. And it's not free at design time and it's not free at runtime. You know, if everything is here, let's stay with SOAP, right? If everything is XML back and forth, right? They will have a runtime cost and you need to build marshalling and unmarshalling layers and all the kind of things, right? It is certainly not free. So it is not binary either. So when people say it's decoupled, I tend to correct them. This is not coupled on or off. As computer scientists, we love binary things, ones and zeros, but architecture is really like that. This has many gradations. So in the previous session, I talked about that one of the most powerful architect maneuvers is to see more dimensions, to break down a problem into different dimensions. And we do the same thing for coupling. Just like I was saying, right, is this dependent on the location? Does A need to know B's IP address? Do they agree on the data format, both logically as well as physically? Are they timing dependent? If B is slow, will A be slow? Those are all the kind of dimensions. So this helps us as architects take this buzzword and translate into understanding the dimensions and the trade-off that comes with each dimension. And once we do that, we come to some very interesting 
insights. Remember I said it's not like you should always decouple everything. If coupling is a measure of independent variability, a good level of coupling very much depends on how much control I have over A and B. So if B changes but I can easily change A, I can afford more coupling. It doesn't bother me all this much. Versus if A is an external system or commercial package or something that somebody else wrote that I cannot change, so my level of control is much lower, classic integration scenario, then I benefit much more from decoupling. Now the key mechanism that we use to make systems more loosely coupled, and I need to be careful to follow my own advice, I said it's not on or off, right? So message queue make it more loosely coupled, not magically decouple. The nice thing about message queues is that they're so simple, we just put a barrel on the white arrow, so that was easy, but they give us really nice properties. Your data is now in messages, so you have some technology decoupling, you don't pull object references through that, you're talking to the queue, you're not talking to B, so you have a location decoupling. If B is taking a nap, you can still put things in the queue, right? So you have temporal decoupling. So it's quite amazing how much you get by just putting a queue in the middle. And Dirk will tell us what that looks like. Thank you. So let me walk you through a sample architecture evolution. The use case is from a ride sharing service. So probably an application that everybody knows and can relate to. So we have a fictional ride-sharing company and the first evolution stage is as we can see here. So the use case is to pre-book um, a ride for let's say next week, already this week. And for that the customers use their mobile app to submit their booking request and it lands in the right booking service. We can see that there are a number of other downstream services. We have several request paths going on. And in the initial phase, we have synchronous integration through HTTP based APIs, hopefully a RESTful API. So what we can see, it takes a lot of time to complete the entire uh, request. And since it is a synchronous integration, for instance, the right booking service needs to wait for all the downstream systems to complete it. And we also have an external third party service here for the actual payment. So this might even take uh, more time than our internal own services. So we have a lot of runtime coupling here between all those services. And that also doesn't lead to the best user or customer experience because then probably as it is right now in the app there's that spinning wheel and the customer needs to wait for the response to come in. This is actually a lousy user experience and this is why I also like to call such an integration that is so much coupled a lousy coupling. So our uh, sample um, ride sharing company now moves on and also um, when, when, the, um, when the marketing department decides to put more load on the campaign, like don't um, reserve your, your ride for the next week, already this week, but maybe now. Um, and if they uh, run that campaign, a lot of load comes on this workload. And this might lead to some disappointment because one of the promises that we get from such a microservices-ish architecture is that we can scale every service individually. But we might here experience that if, let's say, the resource management service gets in trouble because of the load, we also need to scale out the right booking service because they are so tightly coupled with each other. So next thing is that our uh, sample company um, transforms their architecture into an asynchronous um, integration via APIs. And the first thing that they fix is the customer experience. So we um, already get directly the response back to the user. HTTP, HTTP supports this. We can just respond with 202 accepted. And we do the exact thing with all the other downstream uh, services, except with the external payment service provider that we cannot influence, unfortunately. So with this evolution, we actually are now able to, uh, to fulfill also the requirements of high load on this sample scenario. And that brings us to the insights that friends don't let friends rely on synchronous integration, at least not when you 
have uh, to expect heavy load on your workload. So um, you might have um, already um, discovered that I um, didn't show you the responses from the downstream services, but rest assured they are there and I will show you also in a bit. I didn't uh, just want to overload the diagram. So um, now we reduce uh, the complexity a little bit and only look at um, the first um, downstream layer. Um, what we still have is the availability dependency or the runtime dependency that um, when we use APIs, apparently both parties need to be online. Otherwise, they uh, have a hard time to communicate with each other. Now, if we replace our API requests with queues, with queues, dedicated queue for every request path, we can eliminate that because now the right booking service can still communicate because it sends messages to the queue. And um, if one of those downstream uh, systems gets into trouble and maybe needs to get um, down for planned or unplanned maintenance, we don't break the entire system. And here we also have the responses now. So you might uh, ask yourself now, how does actually the downstream systems know where to send the response to? And w uh, the right booking service in this case, how does it know how to assign an incoming response to a previous request? So for this, we have um, two other integration patterns, which is the return address and the correlation ID. With the return address, the right booking service in this example instructs the downstream systems where to send the response to. And with the correlation ID that is uh, sent back in the response, it can also assign those responses to the previous requests. As we can see here, the correlation ID comes back in. Um, so with that, um, we have um, gone through um, a small architecture evolution and we can come to this conclusion here that loose coupling is mostly better than lousy coupling. Well, mostly because we also said there is no absolute statement, right? It always depends on the particular use case, um, what kind of or what level of coupling you can afford. Mm. So I guess you consider SOAP lousy? Lousy coupling? I would definitely <laughs> do that, <laughs> okay, yes. Fair, <laughs> fair, fair enough. Let's go to our second topic. And this one is a little bit of a tongue twister, right? It talks about control flow and flow control. And that is not a word game because both are essential to understanding how distributed systems work and they actually have quite a bit to do with each other. And as you might have almost guessed, the story starts with two boxes and a line. Except the line is blue now. Something has changed because we mentioned at the beginning, what does this line actually depict? Is this data flow or is this control flow? Like in some instances, when you use messaging, those two coincide. I put them, you know, A puts the message on, it goes to B, right? So the control flow, A is actively pushing, right? And B is receiving and the data also flows from A to B. Life is good, but that is not always the case. So Dirk's example was HTTP. HTTP has responses. It is no longer just one way. I send something, but something comes back. That might be a 200, but that might be also more. So I might be actually inverting this where I'm polling. So polling has the control flow going one way because I'm, well, in this case, this way, sorry guys, like B is polling from A, but the data flow is still going this direction. So very careful here, right? Data flow and control flow is something very different. And in a polling example, they point opposite directions. So hence, we need to be careful which aspect we talk about. Now, we were joking about the old book from like 20 years ago, which is still quite valid because it captures all these messaging patterns, right? Like the message routers and filters and, and transformer kind of things. There's always a little bit of an insider joke. If anybody knows this message icon, very good. Nobody does because it doesn't exist. Um, I cheated you. I added this later. This is a scatter gather icon. But more importantly, these patterns deal with data flow, right? This is like, oh, data goes in, it gets translated, the data gets enriched, right? The data gets split from one piece into multiple pieces. So essentially, you could claim that the book Enterprise Integration Pattern only talked about half the story. 
Now, in Bobby, in my defense, I would say it was like 730 pages, so we probably had a reasonable excuse to stop right there, but we should fill that gap. And actually, a good friend of mine, Ivan Gewurz, many years later, came up with extending the notation to say, hey, you show data flow, but why don't we also show control flow? And the little nose means it's an active threat, something that is running on its own. Sometimes people say agent, right? Something that is active. And the little nook, the, the counterpart is passive, right? Where something is waiting. So this can be polling and waiting for somebody to poll. And you can easily see, well, there's two versions on each side. So two to the second is four. So there's four variations. And you will find some very familiar candidates, a Q. So when I said earlier that the queue doesn't change the control flow, that was not 100% correct because the queue has two control flows pushing in opposite directions, right? One person sticks it into the queue and the other side fetches it from the queue. Both sides are active and the queue is, active, uh, is passive on both sides. So suddenly we can express this much more nicely and we have terms for this like a driver, puller, pusher and a queue and event driven sources and polling sources and passive sources. So that allows us to now depict both what happens to the data, but also how the control flow takes place. And for distributed systems, for scalability and latency, control flow is extremely important. So let's map this to some serverless AWS services, right? I'm on the serverless team, so things that we work with and things that we like are event bridge. Now, always careful, event bridge comes in three different flavors, right? There's the event bridge bus, there's pipes, and there's scheduler. So here we're talking about bus. An event bridge bus is a push model, right? It doesn't fetch data from anywhere. You push the data in, for example, from SNS. So the source actively pushes, and then the data goes through, and it gets pushed back out. So all the noses, right, pointing to the right. Very easy to understand and relatively easy to work with. But there's an interesting nuance. EventBridge has a special target, and that target is called API destination. So we're not sticking this into SQS, but we're calling an HTTP API, perhaps somebody else's API. Now, pushing messages at the arrival rate into somebody else's API is not called integration, that is called denial of service attack because they might not like your arrival rate. So what they want, and we have a setting for this, this is the invocation rate, they will want to set what is the maximum request per second that they're willing to put up with. Now you have a problem, right? This thing you know, pulls messages at maximum 10 per second. These come in at 100 or 1,000. Well, where are they going to go? The notation makes this very easy. What is the thing that matches, you know, that can fit here? There's only one thing that can fit there, and that is a queue. So EventBridge has a queue for this purpose, and that queue has a time to live setting. If you read the documentation very carefully, it tells you if you put an API destination, be careful that the mismatch between arrival and processing rate is not too high, because your messages will evaporate and go on the dead letter queue. So suddenly we can express this very nicely. Let's try the inverse, right? There's EventBridge pipes, and EventBridge pipes is pulling. It pulls from a source. It can pull, for example, from SQS, right? So SQS can be passive, and pipes pulls from that, and then it pushes out. And as you might have thought, it also has API destinations as a target. So the question now is, aha, same problem as before. What do I need to, what do, I need to do to make sure that I don't overload my destination? The nice thing is, now we see, hey, this thing already has a driver. I don't need a second driver. I have control over my control flow here. So I don't need to put another queue in. I just slow down the polar, right? I can just fetch things more slowly, right, to comply with this rate. And that's what EventBridge Pipes does. So understanding that connection is very, very valuable because the data flow is sort of your functionality. This is what happens to the data, transforming, filtering, whatever, right? But the control flow, that determines these fundamental properties like how this thing scales, how much latency you will have. Like a queue will increase 
latency because the polar doesn't run a million times a second, right? So those things become very apparent. Now I said there's flow co control flow and flow control. So let's talk about flow control. We are again talking about queues, but we are taking a slightly different view. We are now taking a traffic view. Like what, how many messages per second come in and how many messages go out. There's a nice way to say queues are traffic shapers. They can make a messy arrival rate into a nice and constant consumption rate. Has many advantages. You can scale more easily. Um, you can run at a prescribed capacity because you control this consumption rate. It's much easier to build a system that performs well at a constant consumption rate than one that deals with all these kind of spikes. But everything has a limit. If you overdo this, the queue will fill up, right? Somewhere the messages have to go. So and that's why you need flow control. Something needs to control the flow of messages. And there's two classic patterns we use. We already heard of from time to live, right? Old messages, yeah, we just shed those to somewhere else. We either drop them or post process them later, but you know they have to go somewhere or I put back pressure on the system where I slow down the arrival. I must do one or the other, otherwise I will have queues that ultimately fill up. So interestingly, some of these patterns map directly to settings, right? In SQLs, you have visibility timeouts, you have basically a direct mapping of time to live, but back pressure is something that you largely have to build yourself. The other thing we learn is people don't like time to live because it's sort of my messages die. It feels very sad and people don't want their messages to just, you know, end their life. The reality is even the lottery ticket from 50 years ago is probably no longer valid. Like everything ultimately has a time to live. We have a very real life example of this and it's, it's right over in the AWS world and that is serverless Presso. This has a limited backend consisting of two baristas and they don't scale infinitely. So if everybody places a coffee order, the queue fills up and people are not going to wait 30 minutes for their coffee. So if you look at the serverless presso implementation, it's all right there. It has a step functions flow and there's a step in here, capacity available. And if capacity is not available, you don't take new requests. And that is 100% the implementation of back pressure. You put the pressure back and you do not let new orders come in. So what we learn is queues are magical, right? These little cylinders, they are really can do magical things because they can invert the control flow. You push here and you pull there, but they require flow control because they cannot do that infinitely. Coming to the next one. Order and delivery semantics. Let's talk FIFO. First in, first out. There's also Geigo, garbage in, garbage out, but that's a separate topic. When we talk about queues, we like them to deliver messages in the same order that they come in, right? They have all these nice properties, so wouldn't it be nice if it doesn't get our stuff out of order? Now that seems reasonable, but as architects, we need to zoom out and understand these things from the right context. So let's say we have perfect message order delivery. They go in as A, B, C, D. They come out as A, B, D, A, B, C, D. Is this not fantastic? Well, it is if you have a low scale system and a single consumer, but most of the time you want to have something more like this. You want to have multiple consumers. And now the story gets much more interesting because the queue delivers the messages exactly in the order. There's A, there's B, there's C. But oh, what happened here? B was done faster than A was done. Right, and if you're unlucky, or well, actually lucky in a way because your processing is quickly, right? D comes, you know, could come before A or after A, and C comes somewhere in the middle, right? You now have concurrency, and you have concurrency because you want concurrency, you want more throughput in your system, but you also realize that the queue being strictly ordered no longer means that your complete system is in order. But maybe we have a solution to this uh -huh. when we integrate um, another pattern, which is the message groups. 
So those are basically a discriminator attribute that uh, we can use to group messages. And I wanted to walk you through an example how Amazon SQS FIFO is doing this. So we have again a sample architecture. I simplified it a little bit. We only have two concurrent consumers. And we have now three message groups, the blue, the green, and the orange one. And we have two messages that are members of the blue group. So if we start consuming those messages again, we can observe, oh my god, it's message B again that is faster than uh, message A. But what happens now? When B is done, then the next message that is delivered to a consumer is not message C, although it would have been the right order. No, it's message D. And why is that the case? So the way message groups are implemented is that as long as one message from a given message group is in flight, and in flight means that it is being processed and not yet acknowledged, so consumed and deleted from the queue, no other message in the same message group will be delivered to a consumer. So this is why message D appears first and C is skipped for the time being. Now, eventually A is done, so we can continue to consume messages from the same message group, from the blue one. In the end, the result is, well, it's still not the same order as in the beginning, but we kept order within one message group. So that's basically then the scale out mechanism that you can have. You can scale out on the number of message groups that you have. But that also brings us to the insight that order of messages in distributed systems is relative to a defined scope. And we just showed or seen now the local scope. We had local message order within one message group, but there's also maybe the idea of a global message order. What do you actually get when you think you need this? So the trade-off for that is that you degenerate to a fully sequential processing of your messages with one consumer. Otherwise, you will not be able to uh, keep the order in the end. And that is, in the end, also not any better than uh, sequential database writes. Something that you can do if you are at very, very low scale, but not if you require really to scale out. Let's have a look at uh, another aspect, um, deduplication and how often um, delivery. That's also a nice topic. And again, in our uh, mental laziness, we want to have it all, as always. I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we get that request that um, message deduplication is a must have. And sometimes it is even uh, for a good reason. So if we look back at Amazon SQS FIFO, there are several mechanisms or patterns that we can find in the documentation, how it supports deduplication on both sides of the queue, so on message production and also on message uh, consumption. As we can see here, for instance, um, the deduplication um, when you produce messages, well, that's a five minutes interval, and you have to do some scoping here. And that's flow control, right? We don't do this infinitely. <laughs> right? Exactly, you don't do it. So also deduplication is relative to a defined scope. You cannot request, well, you can, but uh, it will not happen that you uh, get a deduplication from the beginning of time to the end of all time. So you also need to, um, need to cut down the scope a little bit. And then, there's often the requirement, well, I need exactly once what? Delivery, processing, probably processing. But if you look at this uh, little sample architecture here, what, what you have, we have a consumer that consumes message A. And during consumption, there are three steps that take place. So the first one is a database write. OK, it worked out fine. The second one is that something on a downstream system happens, and we run into an exception. So then you should be aware or you should know what you want to have here. Do you really not want to see that message again and process it again after you have fixed that bug? Well, you need to make up your mind. And in the end, you can hardly avoid any failure. So you should actually always prepare your consumption code to be item potent. And again, if you really think you require exactly once delivery or processing, 
it is not any better in the end as uh, synchronous integration or a shared database. And there's nothing wrong with databases, just like don't make your message queues look like databases, use a database. Right? <laughs> that sounds good, yes. So, and since we alway already mentioned errors, um, let's directly dive into that part of our presentation, where we start with looking at poison pills and dead lead uh, channels. And um, one very famous quote of our CTO, Werner Vogels, is everything fails all the time. And you really need to be aware of that because it will also happen to you. So what are the uh, patterns that we can look into for failure? We have uh, something that we call a dead letter queue. So if you have this uh, sample architecture here, we have message C that always fails repeatedly. It might be a transient failure mitigation uh, that we can use to fix it. But wait five minutes un until maybe an assumption that the code makes is really the case. Or it is a poison pill that will never um, be processed correctly. So in this case, we don't want to have this message appear at our code, at our process uh, indefinitely, but we actually want to take it out of production. And for this, we can configure our messaging system to use a dead letter queue where it transforms that poison pill into. And then we can actually inspect it without an open heart surgery and the hustle of production. And again, if you think about how you will continue from here, this message C, probably you want to process it um, if something has been fixed eventually. So it needs to go back into the queue probably. And that means you will see this message again. And that brings us again to the insight that you should prepare your code to be item potent. And anyway, I said it before, failure is inevitable. So just embrace it and let the tools help you. Yeah, when, when we said we have this talk after lunch, you didn't tell them that you're going to talk about poison pills and open heart surgeries. Sorry and about that. Dead letters. And <laughs> yeah. a little Sounds quite scary. Here. So um, let's come to next topic. So who here has built event-driven serverless systems? Oh, come on, right? Quite a few. All right. Who of you has never had an infinite loop? Okay, all the hands are up. Those people are liars <laughs> because that happens easily and it comes in many different flavors so i built something right i built a very simple message splitter with event bridge pipes so i took a message in i split it by its different parts and i send it to a destination i send it to an event bridge event bus yeah and i did this very nicely until i played around and i realized oh the batch size limit here is 10 and I stuck a message of 11 elements in, kind of sort of to see what happens. Well, what does happen is there's a very nice retry logic. And of course, what happens during retry, the same thing as before. It's kind of this prototypical poison messages. It cannot process this message. So sending it back actually will not make things better. So luckily, well, two things luckily, it has a back off algorithm. So it goes to one minute retry. So just for fun, I let this run overnight, but like literally it will cost zero dot zero 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 one dollars. So because it backs off nicely. But the other thing is, uh -huh, there is a very important setting here, which is called maximum retry attempts. And that is something you want to have to avoid these kind of infinite loops. So the important lesson here is that retry is great because if something goes wrong, you have another chance. But retry is also dangerous. No more dis nothing has brought more distributed systems down than retry logic. Retry is the thing that turns a small problem into a big problem because everybody now retries and you're in a worse place than you were before. Infinite Loop Club sounds like a very nice club wow. with a lot of members probably. <laughs> the Infinite Loop Club, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm part of it. <laughs> so let's look into um, the other aspect of error handling and replay, which is actually archive and replay. Let's now uh, use a message bus for our example. We have messages A, B, C, D, 
they are delivered to consumers and if you want to have maybe a little bit more of um, reliability and resilience we can also put the queue into it so that we don't have to have our consumer online all the time so it all works fine we consume those messages two weeks later we might find that our code was doing something wrong now um, the messages have always uh, already been consumed they're gone they are not available in the bus nor in the queue anymore what can we do i mean the first thing that we probably do is fix the code that would be a nice uh, step uh, first and then we can also use a message archive for next time we didn't use it in the first time but for next time for instance with amazon event bridge we have that functionality built in also for sns fifo queues so if every message also lands into the archive, we can just replay it later. The color of the messages now turns into green because they get a new message ID when they replay. And in this example, EventBridge would fire them out to the consumers. And again, this requires us or our code uh, actually to be able to process messages in an item potent manner because messages will be seen again. So, so to stay with our theme, are they like zombie messages? They came back from the... <laughs> <laughs> they were already dead and now yes. they're coming back. Huh? It, it becomes more and more scary here in this talk. So, and also when you um, get those messages fired out from the archive, also take care of your downstream systems. They, they might not be able to consume that in the same, um, in the same speed. Now that we have an archive also with messaging systems it makes it even more hard to distinguish between messaging and streaming because that was one of the decisive factors or differences between messaging and streaming all the time in streaming you can replay messages now you can do this also with messaging but what remains is the other very decisive difference on how messages are consumed so in messaging those are actually cons processed and then deleted well they are still available in the archive but in streaming you still have that pointer on your stream which uh, shows you what the next message would be and with all those questions we come back to the initial insight that every architecture decision comes with some pain and there are trade-offs that you need to understand and you need to consider which is your job as an architect Cool, and then we have one last thought, and no, it's not about zombies and undead messages. Oh. Um, it is about cloud automation. Because all the things we just talked about, all these settings, these architectures, the queue, the retry, the replay, you do this all through APIs or through automation languages like CDK, CloudFormation, Terraform, right? You're programming these distributed system properties. Right, you're not hopefully not clicking around in the console all the time. You program this. So automation is a key element of the cloud. These running services are fantastic, right? They scale, they have all the properties, everything we just talked about, but they are also programmable. They are automated. You want a queue? Here you get a queue, right? Put it in CDK, put it in CloudFormation or Terraform, there is your queue. So I like strong statements, so I go as far to say that without automation, the cloud looks much more like an old boring data center. We have nice data centers, but nobody is asking us for another data center. Folks want to be in the cloud. So if we take this logically, most automation we think about as IAC, infrastructure as code, right? That's the common term. But the stuff we just talked about, is that really infrastructure, right? Do my messages arrive or do my messages replay or can I archive them? Do they get out of order? That is not infrastructure. That is my application architecture. Do I put a queue in here? Do I invert the control flow, right? That is the topology. This is the architecture of my application. So with that, we come to a very nice final conclusion all these concepts that make up your application architecture you can now express in code thanks to cloud automation and that was all the scary things we largely had to say um last comment 
I like to write books. It helps me out straighten the many things that float around in my head. So if you're ever interested in those, have a look at my website or um, connect to LinkedIn. I'm fairly active on, on social media. Yes, and also if you want to get your hands dirty and see how um, various integration patterns can be implemented with messaging services on AWS, you can also try out our hands-on workshop, which is called Decoupled Microservices. And we say we it should be called Less Coupled Microservices because there's always a little bit of coupling left. Um, you can also uh, ask your friendly solutions architect to run this um, workshop with you. And other than that, Thanks a lot for uh, visiting today. I hope you found this content uh, useful and feel free to reach out with questions. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> <laughs>